my name is Glenn Koskela. Uh, my day job is the CTO of Fuitu in the Nordic countries. Uh, I'm also heading a small team called New Business Development, looking into odd stuff that uh, our normal businesses do not touch upon, uh, typically at the early phases of technological uh, fields and how they emerge. Uh, that is across. Today we will take a focal point of this data innovation in manufacturing field. We could take that same focal point from the point of view of uh, public transportation, or we could take whatever other aspect of that, like healthcare informatics. Uh, but to have a precise scope, I think uh, this serves the purpose over here today. And uh, from a research point of view, I think that more technical pieces will be carried by my colleague Alexander. Uh, but uh, please do not hesitate to ask in the end questions from either one of us. We will have a booth so kind of a straight after the, after the kind of a door, not far away. Don't hesitate to stop by, talk to us. We can talk about Swedish and we can talk about Swedish language if on tarve. Uh, or we can, uh, can uh, uh, oh, it's been a long time, it was 10 years in Munich and I forgot the language already. So Alexander can also help you in Deutsch if needed. So uh, I think it's time, it's half past one, so let me start. We agreed that we would give you a view of what transformation, kind of a, what, what, if you innovate with data, and you know that there's sensor data. There's existing vast amount of data within a company in manufacturing field that's typically on a shop floor level, where in the different kind of supervisory control and other systems, they used to have, have analog signals on a control room. Now they are digital screens where they follow the same, but that remains on a shop floor level called operational technology. That operational data is typically not exposed to IT people, but once you do, what can a company then accomplish? Different kind of analytical methods needs to be derived and used depending on type of information we will show you over here. But the essence in the end of the day is how do you communicate that data? How do you communicate to the sea level? This is an example, a real world example of a, a company with uh, 37 factories across the world with the kind of ability of looking into the different kind of a equipment efficiency factor that they have selected to be their KPIs. That includes everything that you need to know from the kind of a machinery level data that we can derive. And to know the kind of a uptime of a machinery requires a certain type of an analytical sets of its own to understand why was it on, was it actually producing something, was it doing something else. If we look at the environmental compliance factors of that, CO2, CO2 measurement of a company based on co consumption of electricity is a completely different analytical game if you produce electricity in Japan with nuclear power or you produce it with coal in the United States. So again, we have different maths under, embedded underneath. The typical pie charts and bars of the business information is vital as well so that we bring the IT information and the operational technology information together. This is what the C-level is interested in. Now, there's something called digital, there's something called Internet of Things. This is based on Internet of Things type of a data. But the business doesn't need to understand what that data comes from. They only need to understand the kind of a KPIs that they really will be measured against on. So they see this kind of a global view. And the essence we have over here is that you need to translate your data within two seconds to the sea level people. They don't have the time to investigate or read more. So this gives a very good view in, in a few seconds. If there's a need to go and dwell deeper into it, you can take a regional aspect of a view of comparing the kind of Japanese, European, American, Chinese, and APAC factories against each other, you can look at the kind of regions, you can add another one over there to see how a Japanese factories compare against America. It looks like the Japanese are pretty good in all those measurements over there, but you can also take a view of that, how the Japanese factories are working, same measurements, and once you learn to read what has been shown to you, although there is a 
vast amount of data over here. It only takes a few seconds to understand the situation. And if you are in uh, Sakamihara factory and you are the director of the factory, you might be worried that this will be the next factory to be refurbished or shut down because of the energy efficiency effect factors of that factory being pretty low. And we can do the same comparisons over here also from the factory by factory level looking into time series data. So this is how a sea level sees the type of data that is being shown to them. Now, if we look at something that is more real-time part, and all the kind of predictive maintenance algorithms that are underneath, they should never see anything. But there is also so always some incidents that might happen. So I'm now delving in into a factory level. So getting into one factory, we abstract the rest of the world. We look at the same KPIs from the factory director point of view. We add something else, like the type of uh, employees at the shop floor at the moment, that the experts that are there some other vital information, so that that is the level where everything is, will be summed up. You can go inside of a factory. You have uh, the different production lines over here. And now we have brought in the business information in terms of orders over there, and we have converted some of the KPIs to something that the line managers can impact on by measuring as an, as an example CO2 on an order level. So we know exactly what they will be measured on, what is it that they can improve on. Now, predictive maintenance, if we look at the risk factors in a typical maintenance operations, it can help you to reduce the occurrence of malfunctions of equipment, taking that blue balloon over here on the left-hand side to near to zero so that both the occurrence and the influence of that error is small. What none of the algorithms shown over here today in this conference will never tell you is that it's actually the labor that often causes most of the problems in various kind of different ways. So we have risk factor that part as well so that we can understand that over here in this company it's actually that piece that carries most of the error. Now we can look into that single line over here to see the different equipments that are been used in that production line. We can even go to this thing called Internet of Things. Inside of a single machine, inside of the warning that has halted that called the luminance sensor. The luminance sensor happens to be broken. There's no predictive maintenance needed. It takes 20 minutes to fix that problem. You and your factory is up again. The next time that will occur is probably three and a half years away. So no algorithmics needed for that. It doesn't simply pay back. What does pay back is to control something else. You might have over here in the line A some issues that have caused over the times, times over here something that uh, is not coming from the machinery. So let's open up something else that we can derive and add over here. This is the soft floor level. This is a surface mounted board system in terms of factory where we can kind of uh, look into the shifts of that, the different people working at different times of that, the same complete line, or we can look into the lots that they are producing. But if we try to look into what it takes to move a lot production from left to right with the different phases of production, as horizontal it can be, the faster it is. So if everything looks horizontal, we should all be happy. And the factory director as well. Well, he will be looking into this uh, occasionally to see what can I do, and suddenly sees that there's a huge amount of time spent suddenly in the factory. And look at the factory images, so we pull in evidence to the production line managers and others to see what's actually happening on the shop floor level, and that image shows that the lights are off. Well, actually, we shouldn't worry. This is lunchtime. To kind of respond to the corporate social responsibility, the lights are being switched off for the lunchtime. They are returning back over here and everything is back in normal. But you might learn over here something that is peculiar, like say, late in the evening over here, if I look into how the, a, a kind of an incident that we have reported out of a system, it says stop by parts run out stage one, and a little bit more detailed information from the machinery that we can pick up. And if we look at the line, after the phase of mount ST2, actually what the system does, the lights are off. They are switching off from the system. There's a three minute time for a employee to make a replenishment of the spares or the components that are on a roll tape fed into a service mounted system. And the time is ticking and it's one, nearly one hour later until someone appears on the screen to fix something and the green line becomes horizontal again. Now, you can't predict this. 
This was football match. So what you can do, however, is to kind of a, go back to the people and discuss with them, maybe making the fix of that problem not being technological fix, buy another TV set next to the production line. Well, it doesn't really matter if there's another one over there. You can do both at, if needed. Or you can punish them if that you believe that that might be successful. We have found similar issues also in, a, in a times where certain phase of the production takes a long time. And it's, it's not a matter of a lousy worker. It's a matter that that person has not been trained to do that work properly. So whoever you put instead over there, you need to train them anyway. So we bring the human factor over here in addition to kind of a analytical pieces that are needed to understand how how to run a company with all the data you have, and you can imagine the vast amount of this, because on the SCADA systems, this is real-time data that appears, but you need to abstract that. You need to be able to translate that information to the C level, to the production kind of factory operations level, to the production line level, to the machinery engineering level in a snapshot. And you can bring that information, give them KPIs, begin to compare regions, factories, operations together. That's what we do on a transformation business. Underneath this, there's a tremendous amount of technologies needed to sum up all that information on a various levels, analyze that information in an appropriate manner. This is not a piece of cake. So I would like to invite Alexander to explain the conflict in, and difficult parts of this. Welcome. Thank you, Glenn. Are you ready for some data science? The good message for you is I'm not a data scientist, so it might be understandable what I'm talking about. Um, so Glenn gave us an impressive insight into a production line. We saw machines breaking, getting fixed. We will have a deeper look in one of those machines now. It's a CNC machine with a spindle. So this thing is turning, there's a tool in front producing something. Could be a blade of a turbine that's being produced from this. And at the back, you can see those little gray things. There's the data flowing out. So log files flowing out of the system. Our target is now to understand the data coming out of one of those spindles. Because we want to improve the production, we want to improve the maintenance processes, and there are downtimes that hinder us, that should be reduced, um, best case up to zero. So I, we listed some of those downtimes, and now we have to understand the production process. We have to understand why are those down, downtimes there, um, and how can they be um, reduced. And that's why we created two models, a white box model and a black box model. So a white box model is a model that takes some effort for the modeling process itself. So we try to understand the production process. We are talking to people, we are reading handbooks, um, and then we list down all the details about the production process. The black box model, totally different. We are only looking at data. We have a brief understanding how this production works, but we simply look at the data and try to understand everything from only looking at this data that we get from the machines. The production process from the white box model looked like that. It took us a week to list down all those bits and pieces. So there's um, idle time, there's definitely also operational time, there's mounting tools, tool changes, starting losses, maintenance, and this is what we learned from the handbooks and from the people in the production line and from the processes that we're writing down. And then we started to look at the data and now it becomes interesting. So um, you have to imagine we created data from those machines for six days. We generated 30 million events. We extrapolated those events, so in the end we had 70 million events, a big list of timely events. And you, you need to understand th these events somehow, so you have to start clustering them. And so that's why we used the machine learning algorithm um, like this, k-means clustering, and I would like to explain now how this works. So imagine you have a, a big space of events, two or three dimensional, with millions of events, and you need to cluster this somehow. So how do you do that? You put little flags in this event space like that, crosses, and they have different colors. Let's say a red, a green and a blue cross, and all the events which are next to those crosses 
take the same color like the crosses. So suddenly you have a cloud of red, green, and blue events. What do you do then? You calculate the geographical means of, also of all those events and move the flag to this geographical means, which the result of that will be that some of those bubbles will suddenly take on different colors because now they are closer to other crosses. And you do this with certain iterations up to the point where no of, no, none of those flags will move anymore. And then you will have, have well-separated well event spaces with certain event types. So you will have a red cloud, a green cloud, and a blue cloud again. That's how you create your event types, your clouds of um, events. And then you have to find out how many of those crosses should be set. So how many are events types are really relevant in the production. So you have to try out 5, 6, 7, 8, 15. Um, and you can also do a calculation. And then there will be an elbow graph. This elbow graph will tell you at what point there won't be any more significant event clouds um, when you put more crosses. And in our case, at six, at, so six crosses, six major event types, there was no significant um, appearance of new event clouds anymore. So, and then we had to start guessing. So we had our event space with different clouds. You can see it in the three-dimensional space. And then we really had to start guessing what could that all be. For cluster 2, 5, and 6, we guessed because there was a good separation in space. Um, cluster 1 had a good um, significant separation in time. Cluster 4 and 6 had a good separation in time and focus. And cluster 3, there were events which could not really be allocated, so we said this is rest. So we don't know exactly what, what this might be, all for k equals six. And the guessing now is the following. So cluster one with a long duration of days, we said, okay, this must be idle time. So nothing is moving, there's no moving at all. This must be idle time, that's our guessing. Cluster two, duration, seconds. This must be production. So the tool is moving, doing something um, within seconds, must be production. We verify this later, okay? Um, cluster six, around 10 seconds, this must be a tool change. Cluster five, could be mounting. Cluster four, and then there was something that was totally unclear to us. In, there was a duration of 12 minutes um, where we found out that there is a cluster here, but there was no explanation for us. We could not really identify those 12 minutes. What is it really? Um, and when we talked to the people in the production, they told us this is measuring. And the interesting part about it is measuring was not part of our white box model. So when we were writing down and talking to people, we could not identify measuring, but the data clearly told, told us and tells us there is an event measuring. And this was a, a little success in this project because data told us more than we could learn from the pure production process. So in cluster three, we forgot this is others. By the way, others can lead to also improvements in the production because with others, we can improve the production. There's, there are downtimes that we cannot really um, explain. So this is something we will still work on. So and we, when we compare the black box and the white box model, and I will do it a bit faster, then we find out that we work quite good here. So our guessing in the production process was really um, the same. Production time, idle time, almost the same. Mounting, there was a big difference. But remember, we have this white box model without measuring, and we found measuring in the black box in the data model. So we could explain why this is less, why this is less, why this is more. So this is we has to be allocated at measurements. So in the end, we can say the black box model and the white box model match. Um, we were, were quite good at guessing, and we can reuse this schema for other machines, and we can apply it to other machines. And now the promotion part. This all works with the Fujitsu appliance PrimeFlex for Hadoop, a scalable appliance that can start really small with four servers, 
um, up to how many petabytes of data, and it's made for data science and, and business users. So we want our users to go in front of the machine and work with the data. We don't want our customers to program. We want them to use mathematics and statistics with our platform. And I give you two more things at the end, if you allow. Make sure that you get a big data appliance or platform where you can really start fast. It should be pre-configured, pre-tested, and ready to run. Don't waste time in dealing with infrastructure, trying out different software products. Just get something that's really pre-tested, where you can start with your real work, with analytics. And then, make sure that your platform allows you to fail, to fail fast. Because only if you can fail fast and try again and fail again, and do this in a fast manner, you can really have a f also a fast success. Don't waste any time in long periods of trying and trying and not seeing um, the fail fast enough because this will only cost your time and your money. So try to find a platform where you can really fail fast. Thank you for your attention.